Since the advent of the 24-hour news cycle, we have all been inundated with a non-stop barrage of media coverage of the disaster du jour. The same story is repeated every commercial break so as to update those just tuning in. As a result, if you are a news junkie, you hear the same teleprompter narrative read over and over. Since the April 15, 2013 Boston Marathon bombing, I have heard one question repeated over and over. This question is asked by CNN, MSNBC, Fox, HSN presenters, and is also asked on any number of social media sites. The question takes various forms, but it always has the same focus. One version of this question goes something like this. Authorities are standing by to question the surviving bomber in order to understand his motive. Another version takes this form. Officials are investigating the family and friends of the suspects in order to get some idea about motive. If forensic psychologists know any subject, it is human motivation. Human and animal motivation, for that matter, is covered in exquisite detail in both undergrad and graduate schools of psychology. Forensic experts have long believed that if you come to understand motive, then and only then can you understand the crime. Despite a century or more of this time-tested wisdom having been used to help both prevent and solve crimes, politicians made an effort in 2012 to socially engineer away motive as a focus. What did these ill-informed social engineers replace motive with? Behavior absent patterns. In 2012, the FBI was ordered to focus on behavior and not the predicate individuals and groups who possessed a similar criminal motive. Behavior is the final product of motive, just as the death of a victim is the final product of murderous intent. By focusing upon behavior and de-emphasizing motive and those individuals and groups who share a similar criminal motive, the FBI was ordered to wait until the horse had escaped before closing the barn door. The motive underlying the social engineer's edict to the FBI derives from a cognitive distortion. That distortion states that no two things, groups, individuals, or anything for that matter, are different in terms of motive or the potential to harm others or commit a crime. No groups or individuals can be targeted as having a predisposition to engage in terrorism, wanton acts of violence, or possess animus against any identifiable group, culture, or set of individuals. It is as though the social engineers ordered game wardens to not distinguish between the house cat and the African cheetah. Only after the kill had been made could one identify the predator. Even then, should anyone at the FBI dare to express the idea that perhaps, just perhaps, the African cheetah was more likely to pose a danger to antelopes than the house cat, that agent would be summarily reprimanded, sent to re-education camp, or dismissed. One must wonder how the FBI could have ever kept organized crime in check if it had been ordered to turn a blind eye to La Cosa Nostra and focus instead just on the hit. The FBI understood at one time, at least, that being a member of the Gambino or Genovese families meant that you shared a common motive, a motive to do the family's business. Now, I should not limit my attention to the social engineers who have hobbled the FBI's long-standing focus upon identifying those who pose a disproportionate threat. Since the 1960s, American public school students have been indoctrinated by these same social engineers who have systematically removed the ability to discriminate good from bad. 
After all, as the social engineers have mandated, there is no good and bad, only frames of reference. These social engineers engage in what I have termed convenient equilibrium. Convenient equilibrium is the foundational precept found in multiculturalism. All cultures are equal, none are better than any other. This means that the differences between cultures, religions, gender, or anything else you can imagine have been artificially dissolved by social engineers in favor of a homogenous, vague classification that forbids discrimination. If the same indoctrination had been applied to grocery shoppers, consumers would be forbidden and over time be unable to distinguish lettuce from cabbage, apples from pears, or milk from orange juice. Motive is derived of both personal and group psychology. One could easily assert that all motivation is personal until one realizes that groups of people can and often do share a common motive. This now leads us to a review of the group identified by the term Islam. Islam is both a religion and imperialistic political ideology that is comprised of a cohesive set of commands and clear directives for how to behave. Another group is named Progressivism. Progressivism is a religion as well. In addition to being a personal and philosophical ideology whose central tenet is that there are no fixed directives on how to behave, except for one. Progressives reject the notion that some things are inherently good and some things are inherently bad. The edict of progressives is thusly stated in the negative. There is no good or bad. There are only perceptions in life, and those perceptions are different for each person living on earth. If one looks closely at the progressive religion, one can readily see that motive has been excised from reasoned discourse because motive is mercurial, as defined by progressives. Therefore, motive never fits a pattern because every person on earth is unique. Because progressives de-emphasize man's nature in favor of a tabula rasa, Whatever differences do exist between people and groups is the direct result of differences in the environment. When it comes to criminal behavior, the environmental causes of that behavior, according to the progressive religion, is social injustice. Islam is the diametric opposite of the progressive religion. Islam makes no bones about the fact that there will never be peace on earth until the entire world is converted to Islam. Islam defines any person who is not a Muslim as an infidel. Islam classifies infidels as not deserving of the respect and rights afforded another Muslim. Infidels are considered to be a lower form of life. This translates into a Muslim man's right, for example, to indulge his carnal desires with an infidel woman, whereas doing the same thing with a Muslim woman would constitute a serious transgression. Islam is in a holy battle with Jews and Judaism. فريضة الجهاد الآن على كل مسلم وعلى كل عربي وعلى كل مسيحي فريضة الجهاد الآن جاء وقت فريضة الجهاد من الذي احتل المسجد الأقصى من الذي اعتدى على الأنبياء من الذي قتل الأنبياء حتى أننا لو عدنا إلى القرآن الكريم لو وجدنا بأن القرآن الكريم يعطي صورة معتمة قاتمة عن شعب بني إسرائيل لم يلعن الله سبحانه وتعالى قوما حتى المشركين حتى عبضة الأصنام لم يلعنهم القرآن وإنما لعن فقط هؤلاء المجرمين القتلة لأن القرآن الكريم لم يتحدث بصفة عن إنسانية 
اقتربت من الحيوانية إلا بالنسبة لهؤلاء وانظر إلى الحيوانية التي يقومون بها من خلال هذا التدمير للشعب العربي اللبناني والفلسطيني نعم. لذلك مثل الذين حملوا التوراة كمثل الحمار يحمل أسفارا كذلك القردة وخنازير وهم أحفاد القردة والخنازير هكذا علمنا Military operatives in and around Mecca is an unforgivable affront to Muslims everywhere Islam despises Israel's presence in the Middle East. Islam has adopted the Palestinians' deep-seated animus against Jews who now occupy the same territory where generations of Palestinian Muslims called home before 1948. Islam despises progressivism, secular humanism, American pop culture and all of its vulgarities, including its sexual libertines, homosexuals, feminism, materialism, hedonism, and an entire laundry list of what Muslims call perversions that they consider to be as American as apple pie.